Well, could I encourage you to turn in your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 6. And if you're using the church Bibles in front of you in the pew, you'll find that on page 62. Exodus chapter 6, and we're reading uh, verses 1 to 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. And because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? Amen. We know this to be true. Let me pray. Your word, O Lord, is a spring of living water. It is a deep mine of costly treasure a table furnished with all sorts of food and a garden of pleasant fruits. Lord, may your word sanctify us as Christ has promised. And may your word make us, your people, wise unto salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we, we've... Uh, been in the book of, of, of Exodus, if you're visiting with us or if you're watching online, we, we have been working our way through um, this narrative of Moses and this, this um, story of Exodus. Let's just remind ourselves, we had a break last week, let's remind ourselves where we are and of our main characters. Uh, first, we have the people of Israel or, or the Hebrew people. And what we've seen at the very beginning of this book is that they have moved from a position of favor with Pharaoh, the Pharaoh who knew uh, Joseph, and they've moved into a position of persecution and hardship and slavery under a new Pharaoh who we're told knew nothing or remembers nothing of Joseph. And then the Pharaoh is, is another main character. Pharaoh is the most powerful man perhaps in the world, uh, and yet we read that he's terrified of losing his grip uh, and frightened by the possibility of the Hebrew people rising up. And so we saw him turning the screw on, 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 on God's people's lives, ordering the, the murder of baby boys and, and putting um, the Hebrew people to extreme hard labor. Then we have Moses. Moses himself was one of those baby boys, um, not just miraculously delivered from the Nile, but weaned by his mother and then raised in the very household of Pharaoh, who's now on the run in the wilderness of Midian. And then has this encounter with, of course, the main protagonist, the Lord God, Yahweh, who spoke. He revealed himself to Moses from a burning bush and places this call upon Moses to go back and to lead um, his people out of Egypt from under the bondage of slavery. And as we've read this together, what we've seen is this catalogue of opposites 
And we, we've been pointing these out along the way. We, we've seen, uh, on one hand, visible despair of God's people, and on the other hand, the invisible hope when, when, when God is involved. We've seen the insurmountable power of, of Pharaoh in contrast to the helplessness of God's people. We've seen the inabilities of Moses uh, versus the capabilities of God, and we've seen the reality of how God's people are living set against what God has promised them. And by chapter 5, we, we've seen that Moses and Aaron... We didn't read it there, but at the very end of chapter 5, Moses and Aaron actually go to Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, let my people go. And Pharaoh, in an act of defiance, asks, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And he actually makes the labor harder for God's people. And by the time we have get, got to chapter 6 this morning, what we have seen, if, if any picture has emerged it is this picture of complete futility of human efforts. We have just seen proven the ineffectiveness of human endeavor alone. Pharaoh is far, far too strong. God's people's circumstances are far, far too entrenched. And this entire situation is hopeless. And we see that God's people are unable to save themselves from this cruel regime of bondage. But the story of Exodus is not a story about God's people redeeming themselves. Nor is it a story of Moses who redeemed God's people. Exodus, that we will see, is a story of God who redeems his people who cannot redeem themselves. Exodus is entirely a story of grace. Now, you've heard me say this before, uh, and uh, I'll probably say it again after this, um, but I and, and, and we need to be very, very careful at all times, in our hearts and in our souls, that we do not slip into religion. And I, when I say religion, I mean religion defined as human efforts to make ourselves acceptable to God. our own human endeavors that address the problem of sin in our lives. When we turn to the New Testament, this image of slavery under Pharaoh is one that is used by New Testament writers to illustrate our bondage to sin. Throughout the New Testament, whenever our sin is mentioned, it is often described as something to which we are enslaved and something from which we are unable to free ourselves from. And we are warned again and again in the scriptures that it is a terrible and sorrowful path to take trying to save ourselves through religion. So once again, I want to warn my own soul. I want to warn our souls against a religion of self-salvation. And we see this in, in Exodus, the impossibility of that, the futility of that. In Alpha on Sunday night, we were, we were um, discussing this question, uh, what exactly do we mean whenever we say uh, someone's a Christian? Or, or whenever you say, I'm, I'm a Christian, what exactly do we mean? And we talked about that on Sunday night. It was a brilliant conversation. Well, well let, let's firstly say what we do not mean when we say that. We do not mean a, a Christian is someone who has been baptized or, or, or christened. A Christian is not someone who's being confirmed at a certain stage or, or someone who attends church or gives in to church or, 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 or someone who lives a good and upright moral life that looks very Christian. Although all those things are good, we said in, in, in Sunday, and, and Christians will do those things, hopefully, but none of those things have made that person a Christian. So we talked about that on, on, on Sunday night. What exactly do we mean when we say someone is a Christian, a christ one. We landed on this. A Christian is someone who can say in their heart, Christ has saved me. My baptism didn't save me. 
My church attendance doesn't save me. Having a list of good things in my life that outweighs the bad things in my life does not save me. Christ saves me completely. The Apostle Paul wrote, at the right time when we were utterly helpless, completely powerless, like God's people in, 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 in Egypt, Christ died for the ungodly. It's a very, very long road of weariness to lean into the hope of religious works when the Bible says clearly that we're powerless to rescue ourselves from sin. So by the end of chapter 5 here, we have this image, this overarching picture that God's people are helpless, they're powerless, they're completely unable to save themselves from this bondage and yoke of slavery, and rather than needing to save themselves, they need to be rescued. That's where we are in chapter 6. So let's move to chapter 6 then and hear what God says. He speaks and listen to what he says and listen to who is doing the work. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron have already tried. Now you're going to see what I will do. I will bring you out from under the yoke. I will free you from being slaves. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. I will bring you to the land. Friends, if we take nothing away from the text this morning, please take this away. We did not gather here this morning to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that enabled a wretch like me to save himself. We're not here to worship a God who enabled us or shows us how we might reach up and save ourselves. We're here to worship the God who stooped down in the person of Jesus and saves us. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith, not of works, a gift of God in case anyone should boast. So the hopelessness of the Hebrews in the face of a powerful Pharaoh at the end of chapter 5 is the very image of our own helplessness in the, faith of sin, in the face of sin. And God says, here's my promise to you, to us. You won't redeem yourselves. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. He says, you won't make yourself my people. I will take you as my people. And I will be your God. Folks, we're here to worship the God this morning who redeemed us and has taken us to be his people. And then look at verse 9 if you have the text in front of you. Moses reported this to the Israelites. I will, I will, I will, I will. All of God's promises. He reported this to the, to the Israelites and they did not listen to him. And we're told why they didn't listen to him. Because of their discouragement and their labor. Do you find that verse strange? I find that a very, very strange verse. They are too discouraged to listen to a message of encouragement. They're too weary from labor to listen to a message of, of rest. I, I've told this story before. I know I have. Forgive me if you've heard it. But uh, L Louise and I found ourselves one night um, in, in A&E with Rose. Uh, and we were in a cubicle and the curtain was closed and, uh, and we were bleary eyed. But we were enthralled by what was going on uh, out, outside that curtain. Uh, we were just listening to the drama of Saturday night A&E uh, chaos. And there was one man who, who had stood out from everybody else. And this poor man had tried to take his own life. 
Um, but he was shouting and swearing. He was fighting with nurses. He was getting violent. And, and soon the police were called to control him. Uh, and not long after the police were there, they were sitting with him. Uh, soon they got a call, which, which was deemed to be uh, a more uh, serious emergency than, than, than him. And so they weren't able to leave him. Uh, so I don't know where they got this idea from. They contacted somebody from the local Elam Pentecostal Church. Uh, and someone volunteered to come up and sit with this man in a and &E from the church. And it was the, it was the young youth pastor uh, fr from the Elam church. And so this young youth pastor comes and he sits with this guy. Uh, and all of a sudden, we're, Louise and I are just f entirely focused on this conversation happening with this youth, youth pastor uh, and this man. And very soon we're hearing this man's woes. And he says, look, I have completely ruined my life with drugs. And I have completely destroyed all my relationships with, with my consumption of alcohol. I've lost my job. My wife has, has left me. My kids won't even talk to me. And, and he said, I am, I'm such a disgrace that I'm better off dead. And the youth pastor said, do you know what you need to do? You need to start coming to my church. And Louise turned around and said to me, the last thing that man needs to hear about is church. That man needs to hear about Jesus. Now, what does she mean by that? Because Louise is not anti-church. This is what she meant. She says it's very, very, very common for people to feel so unworthy to come in through those front doors completely unworthy to be in the presence of us this morning. They're either too full of shame, they're too broken, they're too messy, they're too addicted to come to church. And, and they, they, they hear a message that says to them, do you know, Christ died to make you a child of God. And they say, that sounds lovely, but that's not for me. Not after the way men have used my body not after the way I have treated others, not after the way my life has panned out. And God says, I will take you to be my own child. And they say in their discouragement, no, he won't. No, he won't. Or it's very common for people to have tried church and they've tried being good. They've tried coming to church and being good. They've tried the church thing, uh, that they've been baptized, that they've started to read their Bible, that they've, they've attended home groups. They used to do all that, then they come off the rails, they went into uh, old habits, and people can view the Christian life to be too hard for them, something they keep failing at. And God says to them, I will redeem you. And they say, with my track record of failure, no, he won't. And what Louise meant that night in A&E is that that man didn't need to hear a message of him doing anything. He needed to hear a message of Jesus who has done it all for him. You see, in verse 9, the Hebrew people were wallowing in discouragement and in heavy burdens of labor. They were not able nor nor willing to hear God say, if you would just look up from your discouragement, if you would just look up from your burden, you will see the Jesus who says, I will do this for you. I will do this for you. And God says to the people, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment, I will take you to be a people. I will be your God. And they say, no, you won't. My friends, please let's not be too discouraged this morning to hear a message of encouragement. Please let's not be too burdened by anything to hear a message of that burden being lifted. Let me finish quickly uh, this morning. I want to um, say something about this imagery and maybe we'll pick up on this on Wednesday evening at the gathering, but God says 
Um, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. You know, the holy God of heaven stands before us this morning with outstretched arms. There's perhaps no better picture of this than the, the parable of the father who stands and waits for the prodigal son. We know that parable and that picture of the father who stands and waits for the son. And when he sees him from afar off, he, he, he runs towards him. And what does he do? He, he throws his arms around him and he hugs him. And I want to say from the Bible this morning that the arms of God are outstretched towards us this morning if we would enter his embrace. But let's not forget or let's not take that for granted that when we talk about redeemed, when we talk about redemption, we're talking about a price being paid for us. Our redemption is free to us, but it comes at a great cost to our Redeemer. And our embrace within God's outstretched arms this morning, it comes at the cost of his mighty act of judgment against our sin. Directed away from us, but poured out upon our Redeemer at Calvary. That's how we can say that we contribute nothing to our salvation because God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And as Andrew read earlier and as Chloe told the children earlier, all of these promises that God makes to us, all of these promises, promises of redemption, promises of liberation, promises of adoption, promises of forgiveness and salvation, all of God's promises find their yes and their amen in Jesus. So let us never be so discouraged as to not be encouraged by the gospel. Let us never be so burdened as to not know the rest of God's promises. Let us look to Jesus and hear him say, I will. I will. Let me pray. Lord God, we want to thank you that our Redeemer is Jesus Christ. We thank you that you haven't asked us to save ourselves, but you sent your Son to seek and to save the lost. By your Spirit, let us know encouragement and rest. By your Spirit, let us know the Father's embrace. By your spirit, would you let us know that we have been redeemed from the bondage and the slavery of our sin in and through our Redeemer's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.